So for this video, we're going to find the domain of each function, and then we're going to write it in interval notation. So take a look at the three examples that I have here. All three of these look like rational expressions. They're all written in fraction form. So typically when we're finding the domain of our function, especially ones written in fraction form, the one set rule that we need to remember is we need to set the denominator equal to zero and solve. Right, when we're finding the domain, we're finding where our function exists in our entire coordinate system. Where does it lie? And the domain specifically references the x values. What x values apply to my function? What we know about uh, fractions is that fractions are undefined when the denominator equals zero. So that's why we set the denominator equal to zero and solve, because that gives us the value where it's going to be undefined. That lets us know what does not work for our domain. So then our domain is everything except for those values. But we need to remember, set the denominator equal to zero and solve. So for example, A, our denominator is x plus three. We set that equal to zero and we solve this for x. So we subtract three on both sides getting us that x is equal to negative 3. Now if we're looking this at this nu on a number line, what this is actually telling us is that we have a hole at negative 3. Our domain exists everywhere else except for that hole. Right? So that's what we need to understand from this. So when we write our answer in interval notation, we need to include everything except for negative 3. So when we do interval notation, it gets written from left to right as far as a graph is concerned. So because this is going off in either direction, to the left, I know that goes off to negative infinity. To the right, that goes off to positive infinity. So interval notation would look like this. We're coming from negative infinity, and it's going to come to the negative 3, and it's going to stop there. Right? It's going to pick back up on the other side of negative 3, and then it's going to keep going to positive infinity. Right, because we do have the open dot at negative 3, we need to make sure we have parentheses and not brackets. Brackets means that you actually include that number, and we don't want to include negative 3, because remember, that's what throws it off. Also, by infinities, you will always have parentheses by infinities, because you can never actually get to infinity. Right, so negative infinity up until negative 3, and then we pick back up on the other side of negative 3 to positive infinity. Moving on to our next example, we have the square root of x plus 3 in our denominator. So we want to set that equal to 0, but one thing that we need to keep in mind when it comes to radicals is that we always want radicals to be positive. We don't want them to be negative inside the radical because that's what throws it off. So if we have something in radical form, what we do is we take what's underneath the radical and we set it uh, equal to, or we set it greater than zero. We want this to equals to something greater than zero because we want it to be positive because we only want to take square roots of positive numbers. All right. So in order to solve this, we're going to subtract 3 on both sides, giving us that x is greater than negative 3. So I like to do a number line. It just gives a really good visual, and it, I think it helps when you're trying to write something in interval notation. So we want to graph x is greater than negative 3. So here's negative 3. And if we want everything greater than negative 3, we want everything to the right of negative 3. Now, it can't actually equal negative 3. It needs to be bigger than negative 3. Right? So we have a hole at negative 3, but everything bigger than it works. So the interval notation for that looks like, well, on the left-hand side, we have negative 3. And that's going to go off to positive infinity to the right-hand side. Otherwise, moving on to our last example, example C, we have the absolute value of x plus 3, and we're going to set that equal to 0. The fact that its absolute value um, 
Typically with absolute value equations, we would set them equal to the positive and negative representation of whatever this number is over here. So like for example, if I had the absolute value of x plus 3 is equal to 4 and they actually wanted us to solve this, the absolute value rule says to take x plus 3 is equal to 4, x plus 3 is equal to negative 4. But we have 0. There's no such thing as a positive and a negative zero. Zero has no sign to it. So because we're talking about zero, we actually are going to ignore the rules for absolute value on it and splitting it into the two separate equations. And we're just going to solve this equation here, which means we're just going to subtract three on both sides. That's going to be x is equal to 3. So we're actually going to get the same thing that we got in example A. We have negative infinity to negative 3, and then it picks back up at negative 3 to positive infinity. Otherwise, that's it for this video.